sand mines and measuring the air quality around frac sand mines. I know there are a lot of concerns and considerations here in Walpaca County. I understand there's an initiative moving forward about how to permit these kinds of facilities. And I hope that during my talk and afterwards, I can maybe shed some light on the work we're doing that will help inform you folks about the directions you want to go. I want to first acknowledge our partners, uh, and that is UW Stout. Uh, actually, we have an instrument they've loaned us that I'll show tonight. The RJ Lee Group is actually a private industrial lab, and they analyze our filters, and they do great work. We also are collaborating with the University of Iowa Environmental Health Center. Um, they have loaned us some equipment, and they provide expertise also during this process. The most important uh, collaborators are my students, and you'll see pictures of them. They've been out in minus 20 degrees, wind chill, all kinds of conditions. I've seen their lips turn blue, their fingers start to shake, but my students are in the field and they're gaining great experience. And that's maybe a little lead in here to talk about, we are not pro or anti frac sand mining. As a matter of fact, if my students get jobs with frac sand facilities, I'm happy, because I know they will do a good job. So the work we're doing here is really pro public health. What have we found? What have others found? How do we move forward to make decisions of whether or not to allow these facilities and if so, how to regulate and monitor them. So what I'll talk tonight about, um, I'll start with the punchline, the summary right away, let you know where we stand in terms of our work. I'll also talk about how particles and silica get into the air, the health risks we're concerned about, how the DNR regulates fine particles and silica in Wisconsin, then a little more about the actual data that have been collected on PM or part of particulate matter. I'll talk about Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, the Mine Safety and Health Administration, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, industry measurements, as well as our own data, and then come to conclusions. Um, I really encourage your questions. I know people are concerned about frac sand mining in Wisconsin, and really I encourage you at the end of the talk, which will be pretty brief, to ask me the questions you want answers to. 
and I'll, I'll do my best to, to answer it in what I know so far. So the summary is that really these activities of frac sand mining, processing, and transporting the frac sand increase fine dust levels. And these fine dusts are called PM 2.5. So they're 2.5 micrometers and smaller, even smaller. And that's about 20 times less than a strand of hair. So we actually can't see these fine particles. We actually need to measure them. Um, the particles we know from dirty cities. Um, as a matter of fact, um, I'm a professor, so I will be asking you questions during the lecture. <laughs> and there will be a couple of quiz questions, not graded. <laughs> but there's a, a city that's been in the news, particularly the last several years, we see really, really poor air quality. Very high levels of these PM 2.5. What international city am I talking about? Beijing. Beijing. So it's just keeping in mind that very, very dirty air, levels are about 800 in Beijing. The, the EPA standard is 12. So it's a real visual representation of how people in China are really suffering from the effects of this air pollution. The levels we measured are not that high, but they are of some concern. So, um, these particles, they are known to cause cardiovascular disease, lung disease, and lung cancer, other lung ailments like bronchitis and asthma. Our measurements have found higher levels around sand plants compared to the regional levels. We have four or five regional monitors in Wisconsin, one's in La Crosse, the closest us is in Eau Claire. When we look at those background levels, the levels we've measured around frac sand plants are higher. So we do believe there's a contribution from frac sand industry to the particulates that we breathe. And we believe strongly that monitoring local PM 2.5 and silica is essential to protect public health. So as people in Wapaka decide whether or not or how to allow mining and processing, one of the strongest recommendations I require monitoring. So people know and industry knows what's in the air and can take steps in certain cases to reduce that exposure. So as of May 2014, we know at least 142 facilities are in Wisconsin, including mines, transporting facilities, processing plants, is closer to 150. Because this is such a huge industry, and even though we know gas prices are a little lower, there's new data suggesting that companies can use more sand to pull more of that gas at cheaper costs out of the ground. So we don't think it's going away anytime soon. It's a pretty big industry. I think a lot of people in Wisconsin, myself included, want to know more about this as we make decisions about where to go in the future. So how do the particulates that we're concerned about and silica, how do they get into the air during frac sand operations? Well, there are a number of processes that take place, including blasting. When we, uh, frac sand comes from sandstone, and many of us know it is good sand for agriculture, but also for uh, native plants such as uh, pine trees on hills and ridges, very sandy soil. It turns out that in Wisconsin we have sand that is very spherical, very, very hard, and the right shape to be injected in hydraulic fracturing. So fracturing is a process in which we drill down thousands of meters down, thousands of meters laterally. We inject the sand and water and some chemical hydrocarbons, and with such pressure it forms cracks in the shale, and those cracks can then release gas and oil that have come up through the well and are taken to the top. And it's, it's been a big difference in actually the net output of the United States in terms of hydrocarbons, especially gas. And we know part of the reason we have low gas prices is because of this process. So during the, the generation of the sand, the collection of the sand, there'll be about 60 million tons taken out of Wisconsin this year. Huge, huge industry. There are processes such as blasting, dynamite is used for highly consolidated sandstone, crushing, transporting, um, uh, even in the processes of, of, of getting the, distinguishing the large particles from the small particles, particles are released into the air. So our real job here is to find out how much is released into the air and what health risk that engenders. Here's an example of a facility we've monitored. Um, this is the EOG facility in Chippewa Falls. Uh, EOG stands for Enron Oil and Gas. 
although they just keep the, the word EOG for now. And this is a facility, this is a huge surge pile of the frac sand. We've monitored around here a number of places. We've, we've asked them to come on site. They've said no because they're concerned about safety issues. I, I do understand that. I'm disappointed. I want to work with frac sand companies. They have recently put two big domes, this pile, another surge pile, made out of concrete. I think that's a real step forward. But these are the kind of processes where we have release of particles into the air. Here's an example of another location in Wisconsin here. We have the white frac sand and the, the fine dust. So this is a, a, a difficult situation. This is a dangerous situation where there are enough particulates you can actually see the frac sand particles. So that, that's a concern. Where is that? This is in, I believe it's the town of Auburn where there's a mine. Oh, we also have done some sampling up in Ridge Creek um, area near Augusta. And this is a situation where there is a mine and a processing plant connected by a conveyor. The conveyor is the aluminum looking structure in the middle there. The problem with this situation is that there's been a lot of leakage, so these piles of frac sand uh, have leaked out from the conveyor. So it's not being done very well in my estimation. There's a lot of leakage here. This is an example of blasting in the Bridge Creek area. Again, you have a lot of material being generated up into the air and certainly will drift over people's properties. And then recently, actually last year in New Auburn, we saw a frac sand train derailment. That's another way in which exposure takes place. The DNR will generally come out only if there's a complaint. In this case, they did in Patterson Sound. Uh, and we can see here, here's a truck transporting the frac sand. It's being uh, moved into uh, the, the rail line here, this rail car. You can see there's a substantial emission. So this was a case in which DNR did come and investigate and um, ask for some corrective actions from the frac sand facility, the one from Patterson Sand facility. As a scientist, I want to know how long the material is in the air once it gets in the air. It turns out to be about 10 to 15 days. For much smaller particles, they tend to coagulate. They, they, um, they get dissolved in moisture that's in the air, or smaller particles, because of electrical attractions, come together and fall out. Much larger particles are large enough, they fall out through gravity. So we're in a kind of sweet spot, if you will. But for, us, for me as a toxicologist, it's the danger spot, the stuff that's in the air the longest. So about 10 to 15 days, these PM 2.5, this is one, so 2.5 is about right here. This is the, the stuff that's in the air for the longest period of time. That's why we're concerned about it. And I should also say that um, of the material that's pulled out of a, a frac sand mine, the company wants about 70% of that to be useful sand, larger particles. What we're really interested in is the other 30% because it's the finest particles that get down deep into the lungs. So what the, the companies want gets shipped off, what's left behind is the stuff we're most concerned about. So what are the health risks associated with this particulate matter? Well, in this case, we're focused on airborne pollutants. That's my area of, of expertise. But there are also waterborne pollutants. There are large holding ponds where the fine particles get sedimented out. Um, there's a chemical called polyacrylamide, uh, and people are concerned about residual levels of acrylamide, and particularly as we know with coal slurries also, these large ponds can get overwhelmed with a big rain, for example, break and leach into local um, surface water sources. That's a concern. Folks are concerned about noise pollution. There's a lot of noise associated with blasting, with train traffic and truck traffic. Light pollution can be an issue. Uh, the town of Howard is a good example of a town that's actually regulated how the, the hours of operation so people living nearby aren't necessarily disturbed. Wetland loss that affects local water quality when a wetland is used up during a, uh, in the process of uh, creating a mine. That affects people. Truck traffic that affects road safety, both the diesel emissions, the sound, and the safety of having trucks around communities where kids are involved. And it's certainly greenhouse gas generation that increases climate change. So we are still using frac sand and the extraction of oil and gas is still using a fossil fuel, which we know relates causes climate change. 
So for us in Wisconsin, that is going to mean more mosquitoes and more mosquito-borne disease. We're going to see higher cases of uh, uh, heart, a uh, dog heartworm. We're going to see higher cases of Lyme disease, of course, associated with deer ticks. We're going to see high, higher cases of lacrosse encephalitis. Um, so we are going to see, because there's going to be more intense rainfall events and warmer conditions, that deer ticks and mosquitoes will have more breeding time and breeding habitat. So it is a concern for us here in Wisconsin. That having been said, one of the advantages of using more natural gas, which is produced as a result of this fracking, is it's a cleaner burning fuel. It generates less carbon dioxide than oil or coal or tar sands, which are much dirtier fuels. So what we focused in is this particulate matter. You might call it dust but dust that is oftentimes not visible at all. Um, we know that from dirty cities like Beijing, but also in, um, in the United States, and it looks like looking around, people are about my age too. Do you remember the really dirty cities we had in the 60s, Los Angeles? Um, we've done a good job in many, many ways of clean up, cleaning up the air. And uh, your first quiz question, are you ready for this? Um, what really important piece of legislation has helped us to clean up the air? It was in 1970 and it actually set really important standards the way we go about cleaning up sources of air pollution. What important legislation was that? Yeah. The Clean Air Act, very, very important way. So we actually have seen substantial increase in things like sulfur oxides, nitrogen oxides, and some in particulates. Doesn't mean we don't have a long way to go, we still have a way to go, but uh, putting this in context, uh, we've done a, a better job in this country in the last several decades of keeping the air clean. So much of this day is, is still, though, we still have dirty cities. Milwaukee air is not going to be as clean as Wapaka air. It's just not. So we know that when we get exposed to these fine particles, we have irritation in the airways, coughing, development of bronchitis, uh, sometimes difficulty breathing for people who are predisposed, uh, irregular heartbeat because we're not as able to exchange air in our lungs, non-fatal heart attacks, more people will go to the emergency department under dirty air conditions. And in Wisconsin, of course, we know this is air, uh, air pollution alert, or there's a, a bad air day, and that tends to be in the winter when people are burning a lot of, using a lot of stoves, and there's an, an air inversion, so we have uh, warm air on top of cold air, so it does happen in Wisconsin. Um, and, and lung cancer is another outcome of dirty air with these fine particulates. The size is really important when we look at particles. So the larger two size are the size, sizes that frac sand companies want. They're big enough to create these fractures in the Marcellus shale to then extract oil and gas. What we're really interested in, in relative speaking, is this tiny, tiny, <coughs> tiny little dot, clay size, so the PM 2.5, the very, very fine particles. So that's what um, we want to measure. And it's part of the reclamation process. So when a mine is put in, they will have a reclamation plan. And the idea is, what are they going to do to make that, put that land back into a useful function, like farming? Um, it's difficult, because during the process, there's major disruption of soil structure. Topsoil and bottom soil are completely mixed. The landscape has changed. So my best colleague, my best resource is a certified soil scientist who thinks it'll be about 25 years after the place is mined to get it back into any kind of useful production. And that will take a lot of input, including fertilizer input. I'd like to talk about uh, particle size now. So if we could have the lights back up, that would be great. I'm gonna do a little demonstration here. So this is one of the instruments we take into the field. And we're gonna measure the PM 2.5, with the fine particulates in the air right here. And we're gonna see what happens when we get a little bit of uh, frac sand. Uh, this is my wife, who um, is very helpful, and also my sternest critic, so I'll get an <laughs> evaluation of how well I did in about an hour. <laughs> it helps me a great, great deal. So we're going to actually turn on this uh, dust track, too, here. And I'll have two samples of sand. The one sample will be uh, more a sandy color. It's like sandstone throughout Wisconsin, places like the Jordan and the Wanawak. Sandstone formations are valuable for frac sand companies. 
And then the lighter sand, I know it's very difficult to see. The lighter sand is the refined sand, the much larger particulates that are valuable in the hydraulic fracturing process. So the, the standard, um, you have a nice strong voice, can you help us out here? <laughs> well, listen carefully. Okay. So my wife here will talk about this. So the standard is 12. The EPA long-term average standard for these fine particulates that can get into the deep lung is 12. And the number we have now is about what? Four. Four. So the air is pretty good here. Um, um, so we have pretty good air in Wapaka, at least so far, what we're looking at. If I take some of the frac in, so these are the larger particles here, and um, just turn it upside down, we can see the level goes maybe four, five, six, five, four. So the idea being is these are the much larger particles. They're less dangerous. Again, it's the residual of what the industry calls waste sand that we're more interested in. When I take the full complement of Wisconsin sandstone, which will include the small particles as well as the large particles, and we shake this up a little bit. Six, 10, 19, 23, 17, 12, nine, six. So without a big puff of smoke, we saw we exceeded the limit that is considered safe by the EPA. And that's why the use of these kinds of instruments and other instruments is so important that we actually have to measure it rather than saying, well, the air looks pretty clear to me. You actually have to go out and make these measurements. Um, so what I'll do is I actually will pass this around this little vial. What I encourage you to do, it's safe. It is completely safe. Uh, I wouldn't you know, sit here and breathe it all night and day. But um, what I'd like to suggest you do is when you pull off the cork, you can see these fine particles uh, in the complete sand. And those are the ones we're most concerned about. We don't see that in the frac sand because those are much larger particles. This is pretty clear. So I will pass around this file and get an idea of what Wisconsin sandstone looks like. Again, if you want to open this up, you'll see the fine particles <coughs> accumulate on the, um, the cork here. Okay, so lights can come back if you'd like. One of the components we're most concerned about within these particulate sizes is crystalline silica. And it's recognized by groups like NIOSH, the Mine Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, as well as the American Lung Association, as being a particularly toxic component of air that is contaminated this way. So here goes your second quiz question. So what other substance can you think of that is particularly toxic and difficult for the lung to remove? It's buried deep in some of the lung tissues, causes inflammation, and a characteristic disease. Asbestos. asbestos, right. Because of the nature and the shape of asbestos fibers, as well as silica, they're particularly toxic. One of the characteristics of silica also is that when we break it up mechanically into small particles uh, and we look at some of the very fine sizes, they have sharp edges, which I'll show in uh, let's see if it's the next slide here to give you an idea of what I'm looking at. Yep. So on the right here, these are the much larger particles we're associated with a sandbox or sanding of roads in Wisconsin. But here are the very fine particles we're most concerned about. And on the tips of these, uh, particularly when they're freshly fractured, so at the sand plant they just were created or just dug out of the ground or just blasted. They have what are called oxygen radicals. You've probably heard about this, like antioxidants. We want to eat a lot of fruits and vegetables. These oxygen radicals make them more toxic in animal studies. So it's the size and the freshly fractured nature of these particles that, make, that give us concern and want us, uh, lead me to say we need to measure them. We need to see what's in the air around the frac sand plant. So silica, this component of the particles, is associated with uh, silicosis, which is a fibrotic or scarring process in the lungs. It's progressive. There's no cure for it. Uh, it also causes kidney and autoimmune diseases because the fine particles actually get in the blood and travel to the kidneys. And we know that from occupational studies, so people who are working in the industry, uh, potters, uh, uh, glass makers, um, uh, sand blasters, people working in quarries can all be exposed to long-term, pretty high levels of these fine particulates. And we know that people like that are at higher risk of cancer, do get more cancer 
because they inhale these fine particulates. Now, Wisconsin, because we have this characteristic sand, is known to have higher levels of people getting silicosis and dying. So this is one of kind of the hot spots, if you will. Now, granted, people move into jobs knowing there's some choice in these jobs, but it's important for us to recognize silica does cause people to die in the state. And generally, we're talking about higher levels of exposure in an industry where silica is used. So NIOSH that does studies on worker illness and safety um, reported 75 deaths in Wisconsin between 1996 and 25, uh, manufacturing, construction, and mining. We expect about 200 people in the U.S. will die this year from silicosis related to these kinds of professions. And about 8 to 18 people in Wisconsin will die this year associated with silicosis. So how are frac sand facilities regulated? Six states, but not Wisconsin, are now regulating silica exposure to the general public like you and me. And the standard that I have found to be most based in science is put forward by the state of California. And it has a number of three microgram per cubic meter. New Jersey has a similar standard, New York, Texas, and Vermont's lower standards. Minnesota recently adopted a standard of three microgram per cubic meter. And I think it's a step forward, I really do. It's a particularly dangerous component of, of sand and we want to protect people. So what is a standard? Well, we have something to measure it against. The other aspect that I like and I, I want to pitch to frac sand companies because um, there are economic changes. People are getting jobs. Uh, the numbers I don't know, it's not my field. But if a frac sand company were to say, look, we're going to monitor the silica and the PM2.5, they could say, we're being good neighbors. Look at the levels. They're safe. If they're not safe, mining company could potentially do something about it. Wet down their pile, chain, and close their processes. So I believe that monitoring is a win-win situation um, if frac sand mining is to be allowed in a community. How does the Wisconsin DNR regulate? Well, what they do is when uh, Joe Sand wants to put together an application for a new mine, um, he will work with the, the, the DNR using an EPA air model. This is a computer model to predict the higher concentrations in a community. How much more will people be breathing in? And so what they will do is they'll say, well, we want to process 100, let's say 100,000 pounds per day. Well, the, what the, the DNR will say, well, that will generate 10 pounds of these fine particulates, and they'll put those informa that information into the AirMod model, including the pollution control equipment, to predict what people will experience a kilometer away, two kilometers away, 10 kilometers away. They, off, they require PM10 monitoring. So we've been looking at PM2.5. PM10 is much bigger. And, oh, this is a tricky question. All right, so question number three. You're doing so, so well, so this is a hard one. Do you think bigger particles or smaller particles are more dangerous to the human body? Smaller. Why? That's exactly right. They get down into deep parts where our, our lungs are not as good at getting rid of stuff, right? We can blow our nose, we can cough. That gets rid of a lot of particles, but deep into the lungs. So, in my estimation, DNR is requiring measuring of the wrong size, the much less dangerous size. And even that, there's less than 10% of the 150 frac sand facilities are being required to, to monitor. And that, in my estimation, is a mistake because we believe there's a concern here. The other issue I have with the DNR's approach is that what they, they'll do is they'll ask for a fugitive dust control point. Okay, if sand is blowing around at your facility, what are you going to do? And they'll say things like, we're going to wet down the facility, or we're going to pave the road, or maybe we'll enclose a process. But without monitoring and measurement, we really don't know how effective those procedures are. I think they should model everything, and they should monitor what's actually in the air that people are breathing. So this is the model prediction for AirMod. This is a facility, a huge facility, probably in the water of 10 or 15 football fields. It's in Chippewa Falls called the EOG facility, I think I mentioned. Uh, the blue uh, circles represent trucks lined up for transport. The red circles actually represent sensitive receptors, people in convalescent homes and schools. And then the black boxes represent places where we monitor. And so what, one of the things I want to share about this is that the model suggests 
then we will have <coughs> drift of these particles for about two kilometers, about a mile and a half away. Now, certainly any kind of emission, you know, when I start my car, it just doesn't stay in my backyard, right? It actually disperses. So we all are experiencing particulate pollution with the things we do, including fraxium plants. But in terms of direct, uh, highly measurable material, we think that happens within about three kilometers of a fraxium processing plant. So the deep, oh, let's see, we've already done this. Uh, yes, we already have. So from a recent application to the DNR to put in a new fraxium facility, I point this out because they will, based on the modeling they do, they will say, what's the background level already? Okay, 25.6. This will increase it by 7.1 for a total of 32.7. This is 93% of an allowable level. That's why I believe monitoring is so important. I don't believe this model includes all the sources, and DNR are saying, well, we're pretty close. But still, it's, it's so close to 100%, I believe we need to monitor. The These are the PM 2.5, the ones that we're most concerned about here. Yeah, right. Good question. Uh, one of my colleagues, actually one of my students, I get so proud of our students uh, who graduate from our program in Eau Claire, and Jeff Johnson is an air monitoring specialist from the DNR. He recently said that there are a couple of frac sand plants that would exceed the federal PM 2.5 standards. Uh, and uh, you know, I think, as probably many of the people in this room feel, that there are other considerations other than protecting human environmental health. I think there are economic and political things that are part of the DNR, that's my impression. And it was really refreshing to hear Jeff say, yes, there is some concern. So I think it's, it's a step forward. Um, again, my critique is that the DNR is not including these fugitive dust emissions. Um, they don't consider cumulative effect of nearby sand plants, one plant at a time. In New Auburn, there are three within a couple of kilometers of each other. I believe they should take into account all of those facilities. They haven't, they've said no, I was part of a petition effort three years ago to say to list crystalline silica or quartz as a hazardous air pollutant because we know it's really quite toxic from occupational studies. And they said we don't know enough about it uh, and we don't know how to measure it, so we're not going to list it as a hazardous air pollutant. And I was really disappointed with that. Uh, the DNR is, is taking another look at silica uh, sand processing. Right now, I'm going to comment on it. And I think it's an opportunity for many of us to say, we need to know more about potential health risks. Also, um, they haven't, well, they declined to establish a limit for silica, and they don't require monitoring of what's the, the smallest, most important particle size is nor of silica. And I think that's a mistake. They have the statutory authority to require this monitoring. So how do we measure these things? Here are some examples. Winona, as many of you may know, Winona, Minnesota is a hub for both truck traffic, which emits particulates, and also there's a lot of frac sand activity in Winona. And so when I look at the data from 2014, we find that uh, in, in this terms, in terms of the PM 2.5, so if you look over here, right, we see 113 at the very top, same thing. So Winona was the dirtiest place in this measurement for um, PM 2.5 and also in, for a number of other cities in, in Minnesota. So this caught my eye. Now to the Minnesota, the MPCA's credit, they now have a monitor for silica and PM 2.5 on top of the Winona YMCA. And I've applauded them, that's the right thing to do. So people in that town know what's going on, what they're breathing, I think that's smart. When the Mine Safety and Health Administration goes into mines in Wisconsin and actually measures what workers are exposed to, and again, these are going to be higher levels. If I take a job with superior silica sand, I'm taking on more risk, right? I'm making money. Uh, I'm not, I'm not, I don't live across the street and have a daycare center. So these are higher standards. And why we're concerned about silica is that even, um, well, on the facilities themselves, even with a much higher standard, we do see, for example, at the EOG facility in Chippewa Falls, that courts, the rest of the courts, have seen uh, a number of violations. Not all facilities have this, but some do. So we do know that people who are working at mines in Wisconsin can have elevated levels of silica exposure. 
NIOSH, which does the research in terms of what workers are exposed to in worker safety and health, did a study recently actually at the hydraulic fracturing sites. And they found these folks, and it's peer-reviewed publication, that means other scientists have looked at it before it gets published, have found uh, the following. The 47% of the samples they collected were above the OSHA PEL, or permissible exposure limit. Another 32 were above the NIOSH recommended exposure limit, and the rest were uh, below that limit. So <laughs> most of the samples were of concern of these fine particulates, in this case, silica. All right, now here we go. This is the final exam A question. <laughs> Why does this surprise scientists? These are at the hydraulic fracturing sites. Why, do, why is this a surprise that we have these fine particulates, silica fine particulates? I think Anne is going to get the first crack at this. Aren't they refining or sieving out the smaller stuff and only shipping the larger particles that they want? You think that's right? Pardon? You sound a little unsure. Are you sure about that? No, I'm, okay, that's my statement. <laughs> A plus. It's exactly right. We think, based upon what's supposed to happen as we start up with all the particle sizes, right, the sandstone, we get rid of uh, the, the mining companies want to filter off the fine particles because they're not helpful. They want just the large particles. But it turns out when the large particles get to Marcellus Shale or North Dakota, Something about that process still generates these fine particulates. So it's really important to protect workers here in Wisconsin and in North Dakota and Marcellus Shale because the particulates are present, these fine particulates. Nice job. I do look at industry studies. Um, this is a study by a colleague, John Richards, published, I think it's good work. He didn't submit it for a journal for peer review, but nonetheless, I think it's worth looking at. And when he looked at the levels of silica at eight facilities in Wisconsin, the standard, as you may remember, is the, I think is the best, is three. He found levels that were one or below consistently. And if these data are to be believed, and they, they look solid to me, that suggests that silica may not be the principal issue we're concerned about. It's good public health news. Now, we're following up with our own studies to see if we get the same numbers. But this is, if this holds true, it's good public health news. The DNR has now published a map for facilities within Wisconsin. And if you go to this map, you can click on each of these, look at monitors where the industry is monitoring itself. And again, I don't have any reason to doubt it, but it is uh, the industry monitoring itself and sending the data to, to DNR. And these levels um, are important to watch too. They're the, the bigger particle sizes, right, the PM10. And what they have found, I looked at 909 of them. The average of the PM10 was 13.8. Um, the standard is 20, so we're lower than, but close to 20. And then the, the, the worst case standard is 150, it's well below that, the averages. When we look at the ratio of PM2.5 to PM10, we find that the average across these samples is 11.3 compared to a standard for PM2.5 of 12. So again, this says, there may be an issue with PM 2.5. We need to continue to monitor. The industry data collected uh, by industry but published by the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency suggests that the level, this is the long-term standard here of 12. Um, and, um, you can see there are some exceedances. In average, it looks like it's lower than 12, which is the good news. Uh, and their worst case scenario, they're well below the worst case scenario. So again, uh, perhaps good news if these data stand up, but close enough to the limit that I would want monitoring. I want to do this continuous monitoring. There are things like um, um, active days. When we go out in the field and we see there's a lot of truck activity, the levels tend to go up. What do you think happens with snow and rain to particulates? <coughs> Yeah, they tend to decrease. It takes out some of the particles. We get a lot of good wind from other parts of, like, the, from the polar area. We're getting a lot of that now. It tends to clean out the air as well. So meteorological conditions and degree of plant activity make a big difference of what we're measuring so far. So I want to keep measuring this. So our research. We found that because these PM2.5 particulates are so closely associated with people getting sick, 
For example, for every 10 microgram per cubic meter increase, we see a 4 to 14% increased risk of death from all causes, 6 to 26 increased risk of death from cardiopulmonary and cardiovascular disease, and 8 to 37% increase of death from lung cancer. Again, these are dirty cities where we can see larger numbers of people consistently exposed. The PM 2.5 seems to be the best way to protect people's health by measuring those levels. And I also believe that measurement and control using the EPA standard will protect us all. So um, when I ask my students this question, I say, what is one half of 50? You know what they do? <laughs> Calculate it. Just a second, Dr. Pierce. No, 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 no. <laughs> Some of us, like me, are old school. So I'm going to ask you to do a little math here, OK? I don't want to see any calculators, all right? So let's do this math. If we use uh, the MSHA, Mine Safety and Health Administration, found in their investigations at mine sites that about 15% of the small particles um, is silica. So remember 15%. If we use the standard that EPA has set of 12, we say about 15% of that times 15 is going to equal 1.8 micrograms. So total 12. The fraction of silica, or the amount of silica, is 1.8. So is 1.8 higher or lower than the state of California standard? Lower. So I believe firmly that if we use the existing EPA standard for PM 2.5, we measure that consistently, we stay to this level, we will also protect against silica risk. And that's a, that's a persuasive argument when a local town board is saying, we don't, we're worried about liability of establishing a silica standard. Well, my suggestion is let's use the existing EPA standard that the DNR has to abide by. So here are my students standing out on a cold Wisconsin day. Um, again, I just, I, I just I really care so much about it. They've done such great work. Um, so we have been out to local sand mining, processing, and transportation facilities. We've collected the larger particles, PM10, the PM2.5, and silica around and inactive sites reporting latitude, longitude, wind speed, humidity, precipitation data as well. And one of the instruments is this dust track. Uh, we use this as a direct reading instrument. The other instrument that's very similar, I just showed you a minute ago, the dust track. Oh, let's see. Uh, this dust track 2. Show this in the light. So this is another valuable instrument. It gives us direct reading numbers. Uh, they're they're kind of cool because we um, you can see a rise when a, a diesel truck goes by. You can actually see a rise when somebody's smoking nearby. It's a really nice instruments to get an idea of particulate pollution. So what have we found with these direct reading instruments? In the blue would be the background regional levels that the DNR is reporting. In this case, a level of 9. When we went to the EOG facility with no wind or activity, we found a level of 13. This is superior silica sand, slight wind, frequent truck activity, it was snowing. DNR reported 4.5, we found 6.2. At AOG, with a slight wind and regular, so this is no activity, this is activity with AOG. We saw quite a high number that day of 41 compared to the background level of 19.5. Fair amount of minerals and menominee, but DNR reported very clean air in the region but at that facility, we had a level of 6.9. As we look with the second generation, the more accurate way of assessing particulates, this is a, a filter-based sampler that is actually tested by the US Army that we use. And what it does is collects, it pulls air through the filter, uh, actually through the rain cap at the top, all the way down here into a filter. Sorry, the filter's up there in this case. And what happens, we measure the, the filter weight before and after. We see how many particles have accumulated. So it's a kind of a simple way. And when you're out in Wisconsin weather and it's 10 degrees and your students are looking at their watches and their lips are quivering and stuff, you want simple instruments. <laughs> we'll be okay. We will collect these data. A paper just was accepted for publication, peer-reviewed publication, Journal of Environmental Health. This is one of the figures from it. So the, the left side is the numbers that we measured. The right side is the background that the DNR reported. So at this site one, we're well above the DNR level about four times. It, interesting, uh, in the second 
um, location. Um, this is going to be a Winona. The levels were lower around that frac sand facility that day. So there, there were some local conditions that made the air a little bit cleaner. But in general now, we look at Winona here, we get higher levels that we measured compared to the background levels. At uh, DNR Eau Claire had a zero level. In this case, we were up in New Auburn, a level of 50. And similarly, higher levels. So with the second generation instrument, the filter-based instruments were again seeing generally dirtier air around frac sand facilities. And of course, the question is, is it dirty to the degree of being of concern? Well, levels above the red line are of concern. In addition, through the incredible generosity of Wisconsinites, we put out a call to help fund our instruments. So I'm a college professor, and uh, you know, if you saw my bank book, you know, uh, it's, uh, you know we don't make a lot of money. Um, but, but the generosity of Wisconsin residents have raised $65,000. So we can buy two of these new instruments to actually do work that is recognized by EPA approved instruments. And it's, it's just been, uh, I've been overwhelmed with the generosity. So now we are starting to do this kind of monitoring in the field. So these are the kind of data that would be useful in court. If there was ever a, a, a case brought that, uh, that indicated that people were being overexposed, these are the data we would use. So it's our, it's our next generation of monitoring here. Here are students up in a site in Bloomer. Um, you can see the fraction facility in my in the background. We have a meteorological station here, a, a wind vane, wind anemometer. We have two of the EPA type instruments. This bucket here is used to collect rain and snow. Um, and this is the, that filter-based instrument I talked about a minute ago. So we're out in the field. Now this is a nice day, right? You can see the students are dressed. This was like September. We got the photographer there. We go out now and we want to be out there for about you know, two seconds. It's just <laughs> unbelievable. So this is our monitoring station. One of the, I think, very smart things, and I think leading the state, is what Cooks Valley said. If you want to have a frac sand mine in our community, you need to pay for monitoring. And so actually we're getting some monies from the sand companies. I think it's a great relationship. We can provide data to the public, to the sand companies, to the DNR, to look at air quality. So from our initial data from these EPA certified samplers, we have just four 24-hour samples that are, are verified at this point. Levels a little above two, twice, one level above 12, and more recent, January 30th, it was on the order of about six. So, for all three kinds of measurements, whether it's using a direct reading monitor, the filter-based, or now these EPA uh, monitors, sometimes we're above and sometimes we're below. And I know you, we see this all the time in literature, but we believe that's a strong mandate for more monitoring, more research. If I were to see levels that were consistently at two, consistent with all instruments, I'd say, you know, the good news is we're not concerned about particulates. But when I get levels around 50 compared to a standard of 12, I say we need to take a closer look. We need to see maybe there are mines that are better operated. Maybe there are mines that um, uh, are in a situation where the background air is already quite dirty. What can we, and maybe there are mines that have taken better steps to regulate their emissions. So what causes levels to be high above the standard at some point and then lower at other times? Those are our questions. In addition, we've begun to sample around frac sand trains. Um, very, very little limited data, but here's Beth out here um, looking very carefully at the numbers we're collecting. We've only done this once, but it's of interest. And these are, again, very preliminary data, but when the frac sand train came by in Eau Claire, the levels peaked up again, the standard is 12 but they came down pretty quickly. So it looks like frac sand trains <coughs> shed some of the fine particles as they pass by. We don't know how much, but we did see a spike in this one test. What the other main purpose of our research is that, you know, can Wapaka City Council buy a instrument for $22,000? You know, who's gonna pay for that? What we want to do is we want to take the EPA instruments that now we're able to buy, put them side by side with instruments that cost $3,000, and say, use this instrument, or here's a correction factor, maybe this will be 10% off, in ways that people can, in a practical way, see what's in their backyard and what local health departments can use to protect people. So we're comparing different instruments at the same location at the same time 
to be able to answer those questions and recommend which instruments to use. So conclusion from the work we've done, we're most concerned about these PM 2.5 fine particulates because they get into the deep lung. We believe that measurement of the existing PM 2.5 standard EPA proposes and DNR is required to enforce will also protect against silica risk. Minnesota data show average levels just below the PM 2.5 standard, but sometimes higher in other locations. The Mine Safety and Health Administration, when they go to these facilities, have found some exceedances, some violations, where workers are overexposed. Mm -hmm. NIOSH has found exceedances of these standards at hydraulic fracturing sites. So remember Ann, she's made such an astute observation. So not only is it here in Wisconsin, but in hydraulic fracturing sites, we're concerned about these fine particulates and silica. The DNR-industry data have found PM10 levels at about 70% of the standard, and silica levels below the California standard, which is good news. Our levels that we've now been to a number of sites, including New Auburn, Auburn, Menominee, Bridge Creek, um, were higher than the background levels that the DNR had reported at the time. Our 24-hour filter samples have also shown elevation of this PM 2.5 around fraxane plants. And then our initial EPA-certified instruments have also found levels that are 19 to 105% of the EPA standard. So um, here, I'm happy to entertain questions, and I also want to let you know, I will provide this to Anne. I know it's really hard to see, but additional resources include things like um, a drone, a drone tour of a frac sand site. It's really, really cool. As well as an industry-produced video clip you can watch. How are these particles produced? How are they generated? How do they get in the air? So with that having been said, I guess if we can turn up the lights, I'd be happy to answer any questions. They don't use those 2.5. That's the number. Are, there, are these processing plants removing them before they ship to the large particular plant, or is it all shipped to the mining facility? Are they so, that? in processing plants, some are called dry plants, some are called wet plants, and wet is using water to filter out because the frac sand companies want the larger particles, and they're wanting to filter out or remove the finer particles. That's the goal. That's their goal. And what are they doing? Well, the fine particles are called waste sand. They go back to the, as part of the reclamation plan, to the place where the sand was dug out. The bigger particles, obviously, are sent off to North Dakota with fracking. Good question. Yes. Do you have any information on the uh, cost upon the uh, citizens of Wisconsin of this uh, particular, on the health, for example? I really don't. I don't know. I know that the air is a little bit dirtier. And we haven't done enough studies to say it's going to cost this much amount of money. It, it's a really difficult but really important question. And sadly, science sometimes progresses slowly. We may not know for another couple of years at least to start to estimate that. There is a, a power report. It's called POWR, a gentleman who did look at the economic impacts. Not health impacts, but the economic impacts. I think he does a good job. His conclusions were essentially is, and what I've heard other economists talk about, what changes in the landscape would take place with mining. If it's an industrial location, those changes might be smaller. If it's a, a location for um, tourism and hunting and fishing, that may be a major change in the economic underlying factor. But the health costs, I'm sorry, I just don't know yet. Would you say that using the handheld and the Army um, monitoring systems are, uh, are they accurate enough to really be useful when you're discussing whether you should have uh, monitoring and that sort of thing? That's a great question. The, 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 not the disadvantage of using this is in the high humidity conditions, it also picks up water vapor. So if you have a very humid summer day, it will, look, it will look at what aerosols, so both solids as well as liquids. The Army instrument does it, it just collects particles. But it hasn't been certified by EPA. But that's exactly the right question to ask. We want to ask why we're doing side by side all instruments to see how accurate they are. Yeah, great question. Their costs, you talked about an, an instrument that costs $20,000. There are, does that 
$20,000 instrument automatically record and, I don't know, uh, summarize or, or analyze the, the results they get? Or is that a human operation, which is added cost? It is a human operation. So it's about $10,000 a year for the instrument. They're actually little filters. It's really basic stuff. It's collecting particles on a filter weighing it before and afterwards. So for a, for a, a mining operation to uh, monitor levels, they have to have the instruments, and they have to have the people to use the instruments and record the data and put it into graphs and, and reports and, you know, presentation to the public and to um, agencies like the EPA or the DNR. Um, so what they have to know, also, what, are the, what are the real costs of monitoring? Yeah, ultimately, I mean, again, my estimate would be about twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars for a monitor, and about ten thousand dollars a year to do that work. Um, okay. And in some ways, it's it's not that complicated. You have quality control is really important, but once you have a lab like R.J. Lee that does this on a regular basis, you can basically say, "Here's the filter, send it in, they give you the numbers." Uh -huh. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Train cars that transport the sand are they covered? Yes, the ones I have seen most predominantly are covered. I have seen a couple with physical covers over it. I'm sorry, it's outside my area of expertise. <coughs> but the, the ones I've seen most commonly in Wisconsin are kind of gray, both top loading and bottom dumping, and they are sealed up. So I think most of the sand now is covered. But I have seen open bed train cars with what looks like a plastic liner. With the increased uh, emission of the, of the small particulates, people living close to those train tracks, uh, is there a risk? Increased, do you think, or is it? Is it? You know, is there enough of it? Are there enough trains going by, putting out enough particulate so that the people who are living close to the tracks could be affected? Yeah. We don't know. I wish I had a better answer. Um, politics again. I've called Union Pacific several times and said, "Can we get in an idea when the trains are coming through?" And they say, "You know, we really can't do that. I guess they're worried about." terrorism and security or whatnot. And they also say that the, the frequency of train tracks, uh, train trips, has to do with the demand of the frac sand industry. So we're working on that. We actually have our colleagues in Iowa have this cool system where they sense the noise of the train coming and they turn on the monitor. <laughs> <laughs> that is so cool, but we haven't perfected that yet. <laughs> but that's, that's really a smart question, I think. Yeah. I'm kind of worried about this weight sand, which is really the bad, the, the PM 2.5. So, but that's just laying around, waiting for reclamation. Well, it doesn't stay in one place, especially with the kind of winds that have been going in the Midwest for the last three days. Is, is there any way of stopping that from, is that a control real danger? Good question. Did everybody hear the question in the back? <laughs> So these fine particulates, waste sand, the industry calls it, are used in the reclamation process, and I'm concerned about it too. There are these large lagoons with polyacrylamide added to make them bigger particles, which are easier to control, but that has its own kind of concern. I'm, I'm a little ignorant about how that will be handled, but again, okay, what is my big message? What's my take home message from today? Monitoring. Monitoring. Monitoring, right. Let's put a monitor on the mine site for the next 20 years. Let's see what's happening to the air quality. That way we'll pick up both the, the particulates generated during mining, during processing, and during reclamation. I think that's the right way to go. Yes. Have you ever measured the students' clothing before they go and after mm -hmm. they leave to see if they brought home something? <laughs> I understand. We have, we have tried putting, it sounds simple, but the DNR does this stuff too, black tape on four sides of barns. And with the idea being that the side of the barn that's closest to the frac sand facility would get more sand on it. Right. And the data are inconclusive. And I, I guess what I want to say, while I'm concerned about this, I don't believe, unless somebody's very sensitive, that living near a frac sand facility is going to make you sick in a month. I really don't believe that. I think it's the long term. And, so, and that stuff is harder to measure. It takes a lot more time. Well, what I'm saying is when you take your students, maybe have them wear some kind of protect this gear or paper suits or something and yes. masks to protect them. Yep. And gloves just to protect them until they leave that area and sit down. 
That's a good point. Just, and let me bring up the politics of this. I got a call last week from somebody who said, there's been a frack sand train, three cars derailed and spilled sand. And she said, the workers are just using shovels to put it back on board. She said, should they be wearing respirators? And I had to think about it, not only as a scientist, but a public health professional. What would you do if you saw guys wearing respirators shoveling sand near your house? So, yeah, close the windows, call your congressman, you know, get on the phone, talk to your town board. So they're political things, and it's difficult for me as a scientist to know I have to think about that distinction. In my case, I said, yes, respirators would be a good idea, the workers would be protected, but I can't say with certainty that they're going to be at a huge risk shoveling sand for you know, half a day. It's, it's a difficult call. But, I mean, you're thinking along the right lines. I just don't think that the levels we're seeing in general would warrant people, if you live near, you know, to wear a respirator if you live near a crack sand line. I don't think that's really going to help us. It's the long-term, slightly elevated exposure that I'm most worried about. I'm worried about long-term cardiovascular disease and cancer rather than... People are in peak health at that point. And they don't have something else going on that that just might... Yeah, I know you're talking about my students, right? Well, anybody, even yeah. the shoppers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. No, you're right. Air on the caution, you know. Right. Thank you. Yes. That California standard. Yes. Is that for a worker being exposed eight hours, or for a 24-hour continual exposure? 24 is for you and me, protect okay. the public. Okay. That's why I think it's pretty well designed. I just want to be clear about one thing, and that is. A key regard to this 2.5 or P PM 2.5 standard, it's really critical though that, that, that those small particles be quartz grains, right, or quartz flakes. They, if it's something else, it may not be a danger. Right. Is that correct? Uh, no, not quite. The, the level for just any PM 2.5, whether it's mica or uh, there are other forms of, of silica that are not as dangerous, amorphous silica, for example, or clays, that level is 12. For silica, it's three, because it's a particularly dangerous component. So we want to measure both. Oh, first, first, like silica glass. Uh, the, the silica fine, fine particles that are associated with this. So we got, and PM 2.5 includes all kinds of stuff, including silica. If we just measure the total. When you say silica, are you just saying crystalline silica? That's exactly what I'm saying. OK, because yeah. there's a lot of stuff that's just plain amorphous. That's exactly right. And, exactly. and is that an issue, too? If it's part of that PM 2.5, so that like clay or mica will irritate the lungs. Right. So there could be the other components, you know, in addition then to what you're actually concerned about that are also a problem. You're exactly right. And I'm really interested, if, this, if, the, if the background level like we saw in the DNR's approach says that the existing level is eight and the frac sand facility is gonna add three or four, I'm really interested in the, the bigger picture of what people are exposed to and not saying, you know, the frac sand company is bad. We need to look at all the sources. But we can measure silica to help understand where it's coming from, but you're exactly right. There are numerous components to dirty air. When we have bad air days in Wisconsin, much of this, the state is involved in this. But I, what I'm really concerned about is just sand and gravel pits might be a problem. They haven't been. And the difference is, with sand and gravel pits traditionally in, in Wisconsin, we have smaller facilities located in more remote locations. Now we have much bigger facilities closer into where people are. So it's just more, and as my wife likes to tell me all the time, the dose makes the poison, right? So there's more activity, the bigger facilities, there's going to be an increased dose, as it were. And that's why I think it's so important to measure. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. You talk a lot about the air quality. Uh, I'm more interested in the water quality around those particular areas what these PM 2.5s? Yes. It's a little outside my area of expertise, but what I am concerned about is that these are big, big pits, or big, big operations, and people in this room know more about this than I do. But when you have a, a dairy farm, when you have agricultural activity, what are the two groundwater contaminants that are most concerned? We need to be looking at, what are they? Manure, Manure which makes cold form bacteria, and then fertilizers. fertilizers with great nitrates, right? So those are the things that are monitored. My concern is with digging out a lot of the substrate and then the resulting sandstone is pretty porous that we might have more likelihood of having groundwater contamination. So I would also recommend nitrate and coliform bacteria sampling around these facilities. Sampling groundwater to see if it's being protected. Yeah. Another thing is that the particles that are that fine are going to be 
far more reactive in water than particles that are larger. You're exactly right. You're exactly right. So they're going to go boom like that right into the solution, and they're going to be you know, <coughs> into the groundwater. Um, yes, the gentleman in front says that the fine particles PM 2.5 are more reactive with water, and he says they're more soluble in water. I agree with the first, not so much with the well, second. I don't mean more soluble. I mean they, they get into solution faster. That's what I'm saying. Solubility yeah. is the same, but, yeah, they, but the kinetics of it is much faster. Well, it's, what's true is from animal studies, we get this freshly fractured silica. It's about two to five times more toxic in animal studies, but after about, it has a half-life of about a day. And with quenching with water, that reactivity does quench. But I also want to say that they're up in the air a lot longer, the 10 to 15 days to find particles. So everything needs to be considered, I think, in looking at the toxicity of these fine particles. Thank you. Yes? This is more of a, more of an announcement than a question. Thank you for your presentation. I am a county board member. I used to be on the zoning committee. I was one of two that voted against a large industrial sand mine in the township north of Bombaca. And I've been relieved of my responsibilities on the zoning committee, probably based on that. The point is that for the last year, Bombaca County has been working on a non metallic mining ordinance. And the public hearing for that ordinance on the chance that anybody wants to come here is 9 a.m. on March the 5th, which is a week from Thursday, at the Wapaka County Courthouse. And I just, anybody that has been attending these kinds of meetings might want to attend that and might make, want to make some comments. Great. Thank you Thank very you. much for that. I think public <coughs> input to this is really, really important. Uh, and if I could just allude to this. Um, the Wisconsin State Legislature for the last two years, and I think even starting now, is, is Tried to move forward legislation which would preempt the ability of local jurisdictions to control this, to, to monitor, to control, to set standards. And I think that's a real mistake in my own estimation. I think that local control can make a big difference, particularly when we have people who are becoming informed about this and ask the right questions, maybe set in place the right standards. This is, we're trying to set uh, setbacks here for our county for a safe distance for houses to sand mines based on the science you're seeing. What would you think? Safe just so so difficult to say that it depends on the site specific nature of what's being mined um, the meteorological conditions the <coughs> topography um, I can tell you that at least in the predictions that the, the DNR uses the model goes out to about two kilometers in every direction um, the other aspect that you may want to consider that's outside my area but the town of Howard has established an ordinance that says that if my property value declines because of mines across the street the mining company pays the difference so that I thought that was a smart way to address people's concern in other areas and I wish I could tell you exactly when it drops off but I, I can't yet tell you that yeah, I'm sorry some of the industry studies have used PM4 to, in order to measure crystalline silica is that appropriate too because you've been talking about uh, PM 2.5 for the most part. So yes. I know some people are concerned that the industry studies aren't a good measure because they're using PM 2. Point, or PM 4 instead of PM 2.5. What do you think about that? Right. Everybody hear the question about PM 4 versus PM 2.5. Industry studies. The young man asked about industry studies use PM 4 versus PM 2.5. It's for some reason when we want to protect everybody, we use PM 2.5. Want to protect workers, we use PM 4. They're both fine particulates to get into the deep lung. So I really, they're not quite inter interchangeable, but very, very similar. So I've seen the industry studies, actually I showed Dr. Richard's study, and PM4 levels he finds are low for silica, which again I think is good news. Okay. So, uh, so I think that they're actually pretty similar in terms of their interpretation. Okay, so you could, not necessarily apples for apples, but close enough? It is close enough to okay. say we're worried about these fine particles and want to protect people. Yeah. Okay, thank you. When you talk about monitoring outside facilities, how far out do you go with your monitoring? What is the distance? Do you discuss any distances? Do you find a substantial reduction as you go out? What you said, two kilometers? Right. Two, two kilometers? Right. I mean, is that <coughs> as far as I've gone to monitor? Um, it has been a, around that. We've gone from the fence line to two kilometers in general. It's just, it's, the science is so difficult. They're like, you ever heard the term herding cats? <laughs> <laughs> so these fine particles, you think, when the wind blows, oh, you know, Joe's going to get the big dose now. 
the fine particles, they do this thing called Brownian motion. Nightmares of Physics 101, Brownian motion. They just kind of, so they move a little bit with the wind, but not a lot. So it's, frankly, it's, it's a regional phenomenon. So it's not just that Jane's house doesn't get polluted, well, have a high level, and Joe's isn't. They're, they're more regional. So frankly, if I go right by the fence line or go half a kilometer, I'm going to see very similar levels. That's why it's, it's difficult to even think about that, and that's why the question about setbacks is so difficult for us to address. And I'm, I'm sorry I can't do better at this. Yeah. I think we need to um, draw this wonderful program to a conclusion. Let's thank Dr. Pierce.